assassins in Japan. I've been wanting to do this video for a very long time, and now is the time. We're going to go through what Japaning is, why it is, who it is, and when it is. We're also going to attempt to go through four different recipes and find out which one is the closest to the original Japaning that I am shooting for. What even is Japaning? You might be asking. Well, Japaning is this black finish found on most hand planes and a lot of other older tools and non-tool related things. It was just a general black finish uh, for anything starting in the 17th century in Europe. It is a European interpretation of ancient Japanese lacquer works and by Ancient, I mean around 2000 BC, the Japanese started producing black lacquer finishes uh, on some of their products. So that is what we're trying to recreate today. This specifically is a Stanley number 12 scraper plane. Uh, it is from around the 1910s. Therefore, it still contains uh, a finish that is Japaning. Stanley moved to non-Japan finished after World War II. So this type of finish is very thick and uh, goes on very thick, but is also extremely durable. You can't really scratch it with your nail. It's been here for over a hundred years and this one in particular is in, in fairly nice condition. So we're gonna to try to recreate this exact look. This level of gloss was probably a little more glossy when it was first applied a hundred years ago. It does dull over time, but can be brought back uh, just by polishing to a higher sheen. It's not crazy, crazy glossy, but uh, it definitely has a nice sheen to it. So we will try to recreate this finish as much as possible, and we will compare the end result to this plane here. I'll also be Japaning a small block plane just to see how that turns out and to show you kind of the methods on how you do the vertical sides and other corners and other non-horizontal surfaces on a type of finish that uh, likes to kind of self-level. So there's some tricks there that we need to know. Anyways, this is what we are shooting for. Right here I have three ingredients that could be used to make Japaning, but only one of them is really accurate. This is just a block of roofing tar. A lot of people online seem to think that this will work. Um, I have found that that is not the case. It's not hard enough, even though it does look like it could be if we split this open. It should have been nice and shiny and you can kind of see the extreme glossiness that's in there but this is most likely uh, synthetic like petroleum based asphalt and asphalt related ingredients and other things that keep it um, nice and almost flexible you can kind of see how I can bend this very easily without it cracking uh, that is obviously not a very hard finish so Something like this most likely won't work, uh, but it may be better than nothing. Another thing somewhat closer is coal. So coal is just a hydrocarbon like all of these. And I believe the Japanese ingredient is very similar to this um, in terms of shape and color, but it's not exactly this. What we're looking for is this. This is an extreme fine ground powder. Let's take a little bit out here. Um, it's extremely soft and as you can see it's not really 100% black. It has a little brownness to it and that's really the important part with making your own Japaning is that when you use something like a black paint it's not this light 
tint of brown in the paint. And that's what's missing from, from a lot of uh, hand plane restorations or just general tool restorations. It's this little hint of brown that really, really sells it. So this ingredient is called asphaltum or asphaltum. Um, that specific name can be used in different applications. So it's best to just find something that's either called gilsonite, uh, which is a trademark name, uh, but that's what we're looking for. The actual chemical name is Uintate, and that's 100% what you're looking for. You're looking for the finest possible ground um, asphaltum that you can find. That makes dissolving this much easier when we go to use it as a finish later on. Something like this, this was uh, like a pound, was maybe 15 bucks, and it's probably more, that's 15 Canadian dollars. It's probably more than I would need for a lifetime, so it's not very expensive at all. And it's great for tasting. This type of black finish is incredibly old, but because it's so old, there are an insane amount of different recipes available uh, currently online and in what's called offline literature. I think they're called books. And if you open them and read them, there are things in there that contain words that have recipes for different Japanese uh, styles. So we're going to go through four of the main ones that I thought would be best. And we will then see which one is actually closest to that hand plane at the end. Uh, these are all with ingredients that you can find currently in this century and you should be able to find them somewhat easily and inexpensively. All the literature and details that I do have on these recipes uh, will be posted in the description. All of the materials will be posted in the description. All of the specific ratios and weights that you need will be in there. For these four and for all of the other ones that I have found while researching, along with my own twists on ones that I, I think will work the first recipe we will be testing out will be asphaltum, turpentine, and boiled linseed oil in the ratios that I have given in my antique blower video, which is 30% asphaltum, 50% turpentine, and 20% boiled linseed oil. So let's add those here and mix them together. I'll use one tablespoon of turpentine making sure to spill as much as humanly possible. Next up is the boiled linseed oil. So I'm just gonna roughly gauge about half of this. That's too much. That's probably close to what we need. That goes in. And lastly, the asphaltum itself. Super finely powdered, a little extra because I'll probably spill some as I'm dumping it into here. This is obviously an extremely clean process, so do this on your white uh, living room couch if you have one. Give this a good stir. Um, it will be very liquidy at first. Once we let it rest, it will become much, much thicker and then we will assess its thickness and decide if we need to add more asphaltum or more turpentine to kind of even out what we need. You can see on here that it's still grainy, not dissolved at all. You just have to let this rest. I would shake it vigorously. These and the rest of them will rest now for overnight or 24 hours. The longer the better. Now the reason I added what looked like a full spoon of this is because I give you the measurements in percents and not necessarily by weight. So I am assuming I will spill some and I'm assuming that uh, I haven't packed any of this down into the tablespoon itself. So there's probably the correct measurement in here. It's not the end of the world. If this ends up being too thick in about 24 hours, We'll just add more turpentine and it will be totally fine. No worries. Next up, just asphaltum and turpentine. 
roughly 50-50, doesn't really matter. We'll add whatever more turpentine we need uh, to make sure that this is all fully dissolved and extremely delicious. We could probably even eyeball this one at this point, but oh, just spill it everywhere as much as you can. Uh, I should have stabbed a hole in this with my ice pick, but I didn't. I am not a smart man. Oh yeah, just spill it all. Okay, we'll get that in there. We will stir to combine, making sure it's all delicious. Make sure to get as much of, you, of it on you as humanly possible. Oh, let it spurt everywhere, creating a large mess all over your work surface. But do enjoy the nice pine turpentine smell. It smells like Christmas for meth heads. Next up is asphaltum with spar varnish. This is a cold cure Japanese recipe. You can use something like this. This is an outdoor spar urethane. I got the glossy version because we can always knock back the gloss if needed. I'm going to try 50-50 on this specific recipe. This is the one that told me to do 50-50 online. So let's see if we can get there. My concern is, is there enough um, paint thinner slash turpentine related stuff to dissolve the amount of asphaltum that I'm putting in. Another scoop of asphaltum goes in. And once again, stir to combine. Oh, it's immediately, immediately too thick. If you want to have a look in there, that is of no help to anyone, but you can kind of see the thickness here. It's not making that same liquidy sound that we had before. And maybe that's the point. I'm not sure, but based on the thickness now, this might be so thick in 24 hours that I will need to thin it out with something like turpentine. The reason turpentine is used is it seems to be the best um, type of solution to dissolve the asphaltum in. Other paint thinners, like just mineral spirits, they don't dissolve as quickly and as heavily for some reason I've found, so I've stuck with turpentine for the majority of these recipes. Finally, we have asphaltum with wipe on poly. You can see the type I'm using right here. It is a clear gloss. Once again, I'm going to do 50-50. My hopes with this recipe, which I have found nowhere, is that uh, the diluted polyurethane has just more paint thinnerish stuff in it, helping the asphaltum dissolve further than just the spar varnish that we used before. We will roughly add one scoop of that powderized Nutella. Then we will add one scoop of the wipe on poly. Thoroughly shaken, not stirred. It has been added. Stirring will commence immediately. Oh, definitely more liquidy than the previous recipe. This looks promising. It could be of interest. We will just have to wait and see and try to get this as dissolved as possible. Shake it up good. We are going to let these stay like so overnight or up to 24 hours or up to 1000 years. I don't think it really matters. If something ever gets too hard as in too thick or too dried out, you can just add turpentine or any other paint thinner like substance to thin it back out and it technically should last forever. All right. So it has been about 12 hours since we first mixed these together and we're going to have a look in each one to see if they need more um, thinner or more asphaltum. We need to get to a consistency that is honestly somewhat like Nutella, believe it or not, uh, or cake batter, if you will. So let's have a look. So this is the asphaltum with wipe on poly. And we can kind of see that it's not moving pretty much at all. It would be sliding around 
So this is too thick. So we will be adding more of the wipe on poly to this one. The asphaltum and spar varnish. Let's have a look. Oh, this one's actually moving. So this is kind of the consistency that we're going after. It's really thick, um, almost like extremely thick honey and basically like Nutella itself. And it just barely moves. This is what we're after. So this one's probably fine. Um, I will give these all another stir and let them sit a little while longer after we add extra business. This one is not really moving. So this one may need a little bit more. It's not as solid as this, but we're going to probably add a little more turpentine to this one. The 50% asphaltum, 50% turpentine. Uh, if we look in here, oh, it is dark in there. Uh, I can just see it gooping around and there we go. It's actually perfect consistency as well. So this can stay as is. These two need some more thinner added. I'm just going to stir it together and give you an idea of the thickness here. That's the thickness we're going for. Cake battery, Nutella E. Uh, it seems thicker than it needs to be. Uh, but that's just how this is. I'm only stirring because any undissolved asphaltum would be near the bottom. If there's any thing that can dissolve the asphaltum, we want to make sure that it gets in contact with that. So we get the maximum dissolving as possible. Any undissolved asphaltum is going to end up being grainy in the finish and we don't want that. Most of it will melt when we do bake it, but for the for the cold cure uh, solutions, we're not baking these, so we have to make sure all of the asphaltum is completely dissolved. Otherwise, there will be grainy chunks all over your finish. I'm going to let all of these sit now for another few hours at minimum. I would say six hours, get that dissolving going. Uh, if not, you can leave it overnight again. Just make sure we get it fully dissolved. And in the meantime, I can show you what happens if you do not dissolve the asphaltum fully. These are my little test samples from previous attempts and recipes. This is just a small selection of the insane amount of hours I've spent on this. So let's go a little bit into this. So I don't specifically remember the recipe blends on each of these tests, but I do remember that these two were the ones that were um, cold cure. I did not bake any of these. Uh, and you can see the graininess compared to something like this, which is smooth. This is rough and grainy. This one is also rough and grainy. So I clearly didn't add enough of the thinner to get these going. These, and the reason they wrinkle as such, is this is what happens if you bake it too quickly or too high. The moisture or whatever's going on in here um, causes the finish to wrinkle massively, uh, no matter what. So you need to just take your time with the drying process in the oven. This one was actually never baked, and this has been sitting for two straight months uh, completely curing and it still might take a little while but it's finally not getting a scratch when I scratch it with my fingernail so the the non baking cure time is quite long so we need to make sure we get the baking right which is the next step after we paint some things so I ended up waiting a little bit longer than I thought but it's about 24 hours later that doesn't matter what does matter is that these are fully dissolved and at the consistency of Nutella, so we are pretty much ready to go. I have prepped four metal lids of the exact same size. They've been wiped with acetone to remove any oils. We will apply each one of these into these, a full coat, uh, let that chill out, and then we will move on to second coats and baking and all that kind of stuff. I do have two of the bottoms, which I will be painting as well, but these will be painted using this.
This is my go-to for fake Japanning um, in terms of the color matching. This one is the high gloss enamel. I also have the low gloss enamel. The low gloss enamel with a gloss clear coat on top of it seems to be the way to go for a, a somewhat similar look, uh, but we're gonna test that out as well, just to compare in case you don't wanna do all of this. Let's paint these up and shove them in the oven. So you want to use either something like this, which is a silicone brush. The Japanning won't stick to this once it's dry and you can literally just peel it off and have yourself a good life. This is what I was using to mix the Japanning earlier. Or you can go with a high quality brush. Uh, you want something that isn't going to leave hairs in the finish. Uh, even if you do get a hair in there, it's not the end of the world. Just pick it out. And if it's some time later that you notice the hair, um, you can just pick it out when it is heating in the oven since it's essentially liquid when in the oven. Regardless, let's get to painting. I'll just do one even coat on here. Call it a day. Let's see how that looks. And let's do the other. I actually marked it this time, so we know what we're doing. This is the high gloss. Okay, I will leave that as one coat right now and we will come back and do multiple coats as per the can directions. I would like to point out some immediate differences between the cold cure and the baking uh, variants of this recipe. The cold cure variants immediately look more grainy and are most likely going to stay this way. They are just going to cure and harden in the air exactly like this. These particles that are in here are not just going to mag magically dissolve and disappear. These need more turpentine to dissolve that, but any more and this becomes a crazy uh, extreme liquidiness. So the polyurethane or the urethane in both of these is somehow hindering the dissolving of these two. At least right now, maybe something magic will happen, I don't know. These two are looking fantastic. Uh, you can see after I let it sit just for a little bit, it's already starting to level out. So I'm going to let these cure, these baking ones cure for about an hour just to let off any immediate volatiles. Then we will throw them into the oven. These ones will stay here and cure for as long as they need. Because the recommended cure time for the polyurethanes is a little bit different, we'll wait at least a day and see what we're after. If we're close, yay. If not, we're just gonna have to wait. Okay, these two have been sitting for about 45 minutes to an hour. We will now put them into the oven. You need to make sure that you do not heat these up very quickly. They need to take their time, go from cold to hot, as in the oven's not on to you turning it on uh, when you use these. Do not put them into a hot oven. The first round of baking will be at 200 Fahrenheit, which is like 95 Celsius, and it will go for about an hour. We will then let the oven cool and the Japanning fully cool before we put it in for a second hour at 300. So this is set to 200. These only go up to 30 minutes for this toaster oven. We shall place you like a so in here and hope for the best. I highly suggest you use something like a toaster oven uh, or an external oven rather than your own kitchen oven as this stuff smells horrendous when it's baking. It's basically pure asphalt and it smells disgusting. So to keep it safe, we will use an external oven on the world's most flammable workbench. So I will obviously be monitoring how this toaster oven does, but we'll be back in another hour to see what happens. I should go without saying that you would want to bake these 
items, whether they be tools or these little discs, on a level surface. So I've leveled the toaster oven. The actual tray in there is level as well. You don't want it pooling in any direction. If you do happen to encounter it pooling one way or the other, you can fix it by first leveling it and then just rebaking, and that will liquefy and reset it in the locations you need it to. So it's okay if it doesn't turn out right the first time, but just know that that's something that can happen if you do not pay attention. Okay, it has been one hour. I've let these cool down a little bit so I don't burn my finger, or maybe I am burning my finger. I'm just amazing. You can very lightly see the differences in the sheen of each one. Here's the other. And they're still kind of liquidy. But these need to cool down completely, so I'm going to leave this door open and give them another hour or so to cool down and then I will crank this to 300 and get it going. All things are cool. We will set this to a lovely roughly 300. I don't know how accurate this is. I probably should have an oven thermometer in here but I'm just going to keep it a hair under. I'm going to set it for an hour and see what happens. We may have to go a little further but do not go past 300 Fahrenheit. It is here. The final results. So before we compare, I need to make mention on the second coats and why there seem to be a little bit of holes in here. Um, no matter what, it seemed that the Japanning wanted to avoid those spots. I don't know if there's some static thing going on or some sort of uh, other coating that I didn't get rid of. It just really doesn't want to interact properly. Secondly, the reason why we only bake these, these two to 300 uh, is because that's the temperature you want to start applying uh, the second coat. So after you're done the 300 Fahrenheit for an hour, you can then up, let it cool and apply the second coat. And then um, you can start the process again of an hour at 200, an hour at 300, and then you can slowly pump this up when you're done with the coats, 50 degrees at a time up to 400. So 350 for an hour, then 400 for an hour, and you should be fine. Now let's compare. So this is the Wipe-On Poly and Asphaltum. You can see it's somewhat dull, but it is very grainy. So some of the asphaltum did not dissolve for whatever reason. Most likely there just isn't enough thinner in the wipe-on poly, even though, you know, it's mostly thinner in wipe-on poly. It's still not enough. So this might not be the way to go, although it does look much better than the spar varnish uh, and asphaltum mix. This one came out matte. This isn't glossy at all. I use the gloss, it says Le Glace right here. So it just doesn't interact well with the asphaltum. Both of these to me are subpar and still not viable options for cold cure recipes. This is better than this one, but it's so inferior to the other ones that I don't even consider these an option for anything I would personally do. Next is the Asphaltum and Turpentine. So this came out really interestingly, and it does highlight the differences that just oil seems to add to the curing process. So if we look up close here, we can see that it's actually cracked. So yes, it's hard, but when it was cooling, it must have started to crack as it shrunk, uh, and the oil on some respects must be preventing that somehow. Uh, the actual color and, and glossiness is completely fine. I just wish it didn't bubble or crack. This isn't the wrinkling that I was talking about when you heat these mixtures up too quickly. This is more just some reaction. Maybe I shouldn't have used these metal lids. I don't know. Finally, the asphaltum, turpentine, and boiled linseed oil came out amazingly well 
It is as dark as my soul, and that's what we're aiming for. I really, really like this. This turned out really well. It does have a little bit of dust on it, but that's just because I'm a loser and I failed to prevent that. But no big deal, you could just, I guess, reheat it or put another coat on if you wanted. So this one seems to be the way to go. The only difference from my original mention of the recipe in my other video is that now you can crank it up to 400 degrees as long as you take your time and follow the steps that we have done here today. So now let's compare this baking version with the two types of spray paint that I've chosen. This is the low gloss and this is the high gloss uh, enamel paints that we've chosen here. And they are somewhat similar, um, but obviously one is just more glossy than the other. So if we take the high gloss and compare it to the other one, it is still not as shiny as the original recipe. It's also not as dark. It's a little gray. I hope that shows up. But to me right now, it's a little more gray, a little more dull than this kind of glorious deep black here. Now, that's why I've discussed putting a clear coat on this. This will, the low one, will obviously then get very glossy, uh, sometimes too glossy. The issue being that it's super shiny and looks kind of weird and plasticky, you have to kind of go with your gut on the type of level of gloss you're after because this is, is a level of gloss that is what we are shooting for. So you can make this too glossy very quickly. Quickly, You might have to hit it back with some sandpaper or some steel wool to get what you're after. Also, the glossiness addition to this doesn't really fix the gray tint, the slight gray tint. There's literally nothing we can do about that, and that's why the original recipe is still the greatest choice. Now, in terms of hardness, you need to bake this until it's hard. So once you take it out of the oven, if it's still tacky, if you can still move it with your finger and your fingernail catches in it, or you can still uh, move it around in any way. It's not done curing. You need to wait till it cools down fully, check that it gets very hard. If it doesn't, pop it back in the oven for another half an hour to an hour at the last highest temperature you were at. This one, other than my disgusting fingers, you can hear is nice and hard. And that's what we are going for. Now, let's Japan a plane and I'll show you how to do the vertical surfaces. Here I have prepped a small block plane uh, for Japanning. Sandblasting is really the best method. It gets rid of everything and creates you know, little tiny pockets for the Japanning to stick to. Just make sure you clean the sand off. You can also just strip an old plane however you'd like. Just make sure everything on it is gone and all the oils or whatever is left off after you remove the paint are removed as well. So the key to painting hand planes is that the walls, I shouldn't even be touching these, the walls uh, inside get painted in a thinner coat than the actual base, the horizontal surface. The areas that you think you can mask off, you can't unless you have either high heat tape or uh, you risk running the chance of uh, lighting the tape on fire. So you're just gonna avoid these areas as best you can and scrape it off with a razor blade afterwards. It's not that big a deal. Originally these were just Japan first and then they machined the surfaces that needed to be machined. So obviously those surfaces wouldn't have paint on it. So pretty much all of this plane gets Japaning except for the outside and the bottom. So we will use our original mixture here. and go lightly on the sides. If you look at a lot of Stanley planes, the side walls are definitely way thinner in terms of a coat than the horizontal or base surfaces. Uh, they must have just 
dunked it once, I'm assuming, and they let it flow as necessary uh, down to the horizontal surface as it cured. Meaning you'd probably have to put a really thick coat on uh, the base to even get a one coat cure similar to a Stanley plane. Otherwise you need to put uh, at least three coats of this Japanning. Uh, Stanley went very heavy with their Japanning and in some cases you can like barely read the stampings of you know made in Canada, made in USA or number four, number five plane. Uh, it's, it's a really heavy coat that they put on. Okay, first coat is on and we will let that chill as per the previous instructions for about an hour and then we'll start the step breaking process. I want to remind everyone that on most Stanley hand planes, the tops of the sidewall and the front of the base here are not japanned. You can obviously remove them afterwards with some sanding. Uh, but just to keep that in mind if you're going for as authentic as a look as possible. Okay, let's let this chill and let's see what happens. I'll see you back after I'm done baking this. Let's have a little fireside chat and talk about our end results. This is the hand plane after one coat, nice and hard. Um, you can see the lettering still. You can go as heavy as you want or as light as you want, the sides have a nice coat on them as well. So you can kind of see that end result and I, I think it looks fantastic. It is not a smooth finish unless underneath it is smooth. None of these were really so smooth that it looked like plastic and that's kind of what also defines that Japanning look. Now, I just want to show you the comparison between the low gloss enamel with now an amber shellac coating. That amber coating as that little bit of yellow uh, that makes things look a little bit closer to what they need to be. There's a little bit of gray still, but this seems to be the best option. So if you want a quick spray paint solution, go with that low gloss enamel and then hit it with a glossy amber shellac coating. That should be fine. It's not as durable as this, but for the looks, it's pretty close. Let me recap all of the details very quickly right now. You should be mixing 30% asphaltum, 50% turpentine, and 20% boiled linseed oil into a jar, stirring thoroughly, let that sit for 24 hours and judge its thickness by having a look, moving it around. If it is too thick, you can add more turpentine to dissolve more of the asphaltum. Wait another 24 hours and you can begin painting. Paint in thin coats and apply multiple coats only after fully cured or at around the 300 Fahrenheit mark. It's just easier to do that way. It seems to bind together best at that time or after it's fully cured. A lot of people would like to wait till it's fully cured so you can sand this nice and smooth and then apply a second coat and then the second coat's very smooth and sensual. If you don't want to do that, you can apply one thick coat and let the imperfections in the castings kind of shine through if that's the look you are going for. You then need to make sure that you are baking it at 200 for an hour, 300 for an hour, 350 for half an hour, 400 for half an hour. You can even go to 450 if it's still not fully cured for another half an hour. Just remind yourself to let the parts that you have painted fully cool in between the steps of baking. And then you are done. It should be fully hard. You shouldn't be able to dig into it. And you can enjoy your life. You can start Japanning multiple things like this wrench that I've chosen to Japan just for funsies. It's a really fun, durable finish. And I really hope uh, more people get to doing this from this video. 
And I thank you all for watching. And if you need any more details, it's all in the description. See you all later.